Sonic has had a variety of racing titles over the years, such as Sonic R, the Riders Trilogy, the All-Stars Racing Games, Team Sonic Racing, etc. But one set that I don't often see get talked about a lot is the Sonic Rivals duology from the PSP, and that's what we are here to talk about today. Let's talk about it, shall we? Sonic Rivals is a Sonic Racing spinoff released in 2006, with the sequel released the next year in 2007 and developed by Backbone Entertainment, people who made the 360 versions of a lot of classic games like Contra, Frogger, and Castlevania Symphony of the Night. Both games are single player racing games where you play as a variety of different characters and featuring different modes and stories to play through. Now, this is gonna be kind of two videos in one since there isn't much to say about each game, as they're both extremely short, so instead of making two extremely short videos on both games, I'll cover them together, which feels very fitting, and you'll see why later. But without further ado, let's get started with the first Sonic Rivals game. The first Sonic Rivals game features four different characters that you play as, Sonic, Knuckles, Silver, and Shadow, and throughout the story, each of them are chasing Eggman for their own reasons and clash with one another as they all want to reach Eggman. Prior to the start of the game, the mysterious Onyx Island appears, and when confronting Eggman, Tails gets turned into a card, leading Sonic to chase after the Doctor. Knuckles is after Eggman because he believes he has the Master Emerald, Silver is after Eggman because Eggman in this game is actually Eggman Nega, and Shadow is after Eggman because he got his transmission from the real Eggman asking for his help, and is then told by Rouge to continue following him. Eventually it's revealed that Eggman IS Eggman Nega, and that Onyx Island is actually Angel Island from the future. At the end of the game, the different characters each go on their ways to find the rest of the cards Eggman had. The story of this game is so bad, dude. So much nothing, and with how quick you can see how much nothing it is because that's how that's how quickly I was able to wrap up the discussion about the story, because really nothing happens, and it's especially bad because all of these characters basically have no reason to fight. The story stuck in so bad blows even more since this is supposed to be Silver's reintroduction into the series. Like, O Six may have had a messy story, yeah, but at least it felt like shit was really happening. They always find myself sucked into the story of that game, just because it's so good at keeping up the tone and pace. Everything about it feels like they're trying. They might not always succeed, they might get some things wrong, but at least they're trying. Moreover, the game gets so boring and tedious after a while since so you have to play through the same six stages, those being Forest Falls, Coliseum Highway, Sky Park, Crystal Mountain, Death Yard, and Meteor Base, four times over. And that includes the five bosses at the end of them, because the only one without a boss is Sky Park. And it's even more if you want to 100% the game, and since every character plays basically the exact same, it just gets tiresome. There's no real difference between playing a Sonic or Silver, outside of the special ability items. Shadows slows down time, Silver's reverses your controls, Knuckles just stuns you, and Sonic and Metal Sonic both get a massive speed boost. Speaking of Metal Sonic, after beating the story mode for all four characters, you can play as him in both the challenge mode and circuit mode, which just as you play the different stages, and in order to unlock the different circuit cups, you need to complete the different challenges in challenge mode. Honestly, it just gets tedious, and that's kind of the recurring issue with this game. It's tedious and it's boring very fast. The story is a lackluster nothing burger. The stages are boring and the different outlets in this game are pointless. Oh, yeah, did I mention that each character has different outfits that you get from by getting different cards? Do they make a difference? No, of course they don't because why would they? The music is also extremely forgettable. Like, listen to this. Now compare that to something like this. Yeah. Extremely forgettable. It's forgettable as hell. And that really applies to this whole game. It's forgettable. And with significantly better racing games like the Riders games, for example, there's a good reason it never gets brought up in Sonic's various racing endeavors. It's fucking boring.
For the game did get a sequel, Sonic Rivals 2, which adds three new characters to the roster, those being Tails, Rouge, and Espio to go alongside the five returning characters. Instead of focusing on the characters separately, the characters are teamed into four teams of two, those being Sonic and Tails, Knuckles and Rouge, Shadow and Metal Sonic, and Espio and Silver. And you play as each member of the team, each with their own story, but it's literally just the story of the game from their perspective. And remember how I said the first game's story is a whole lot of nothing? Yeah, well, this game's arguably worse in that department because you have to play through the exact same story twice for each team, which means all six stages, those being Blue Coast, Chaotic Inferno, Mystic Haunt, Neon Palace, Sunset Forest, and Frontier Canyon, as well as all six bosses and all three acts for each of the stages twice per team, as you need to play through each team's story twice from the perspective of each character, meaning you're watching the exact same cutscenes every single time, just in a slightly altered order depending on whose story you're following. Moreover, the voice acting in this game is fucking weird. Like, at one point in Sonic and Tails' story, as well as Knuckles and Rouge's stories, there's an interaction between Tails and Rouge, where Rouge goes, What do you think I'm doing? Looking for treasure, of course. It's weird. Instead of putting emphasis on the think part of her sentence, she instead puts it on the doing, as if Tails should be aware of what she's doing, like she's doing something he asked or told her to do. Like, you'd think the script writer would place a parenthetical somewhere in the script to point to the tone or the way it was supposed to be said. For anyone who doesn't know, a parenthetical is a script writing thing that you've seen extra characters named during dialogue blocks which is meant to spell out the tone or intent of a phrase, or even action taken while saying a phrase. But the awkward voice acting for this game is a recurring thing throughout. Now what is the story of this game? Well, a bunch of child have gone missing and Sonic, Tails, and Silver are all searching for them, with Sonic and Tails specifically going after Eggman as they think he's the perpetrator. Eggman's, er, Espio sorry, is searching for who's behind the missing Chao incident and runs into Silver, who he follows to see if he has anything to do with it at the request of Vector. Shadow gets the transmission from Eggman and works with Metal Sonic at his behest. Rouge is after the chaos elements for a client, who turns out to be Eggman, who again turns out to be Eggman Nega, and Knuckles is searching for the Master Emerald, which turns out to be inside the Emerald Radar that Knuckles and Rouge were using to find the chaos emeralds. Eggman Nega's plan is to use the chaos emeralds to release a monster known as the Ifrit into their world and destroy it. His reason for capturing the child is to feed them to the Ifrit. Whichever team you're playing as stops the Ifrit and escapes, returning back to their world with the world saved and leaving Eggman in the world of the Ifrit. One aspect of the final boss against the Ifrit that I do kind of like though is how whichever character you're not playing as gets possessed and you actually have to fight them alongside dealing with the Ifrit and it's kind of cool. If only another game where Sonic's friends get possessed actually went through with it. <coughs> the story of this game overall though is much better than the first one, feeling much more cohesive and connected, but much like the first one, it suffers from the issue where a lot of the conflicts make zero sense. Like, there's one between Rouge and Espio which is completely nonsensical, because Espio is after the Chao, and Rouge is after the Chaos Emerald the Chao is on top of. You both have the thing the other wants, just fucking trade for it! This conflict is pointless and only serves to drag the game out. Or this one between Tails and Espio, where Espio asks Tails if he knows anything about the Chao incident, and Tails says he can't say anything to Espio. Why? You know Espio. You know he can be trusted. Why are you refusing to speak to him, you little little prick? And those are just two times where this happened in the game. Now this game is much better in the padding department, but it's still a thing that drags the game down, and this is especially too true gameplay-wise, as it's more of the same as the first game where everyone plays basically the same, and aside from the special items, there's really no difference. Special items for the first three games for the first game are back, but with three new ones for the three new characters. Tails lets him fly, SPL turns him invisible and gives him a speed boost, and Rouge throws bat bombs that can detect her or attack an enemy. A way to break up the tedium from the first game was by throwing in the different game modes that you do throughout the story, such as Knockout, where you need to hit your opponent to get them to lose all their rings and then again to defeat them. Tag, where you need to hit your opponent to give them a bomb and from there just avoid them for a long until it blows up. Capture the Chow, which as the name implies is just capture the flag, but instead of a flag, hit the Chow, etc. These are worked into the story, which is a nice way of breaking up the tedium of it all, resulting in it becoming tedious a lot slower than the first game, where it's just the same stuff over and over. They also have different circuit cups that you can unlock by beating the final boss with different characters, and each of the trophies you get for beating them have different trophies. For example, Sonix has him on top of it, and Rouge has an emeralds on top of hers, or a ruby. It's cool how different they all are. The different outfits also make a return, and while the original four have their old outfits from the first game, they all get a new one, with the other four all having new outfits such as Rouge having her stealth outfit from Sonic X, which is pretty cool. Once again, outside of aesthetic, they make no difference, but it is cool to see different outfits much like it was in the first game. Musically, this game is probably worse than the first game, as while the first game had tracks that, while not bad, had no memorability to them, the second game only has one memorable song, and that's Race to Win. The rest of the songs are either dog shit or forgettable as hell. Once again, first in person, listen to this!
Then listen to this. Much like the first game, it's not bad, but extremely forgettable, and that applies to this entire game. It's definitely better than the first game, but it's not saying much when it still suffers from a lot of the same issues, which leads to it not only blending in with the first game in many ways, but leading both of them to not stand out in any way. And that's really all there is to say about this game though. But now that we've gone through both games, let's move on to wrapping up this video. And that was the Sonic Rivals duology, ladies and gentlemen. Games that, while the first game gets extremely boring and tedious very quickly due to the lack of content and having to do the same thing over and over again, with a story mode that is so much nothing it feels fucking ass to even sit through, the second game ends a lot more content to break up the tedium and keep it from getting boring nearly as fast, but after a while it too becomes a bit of a slog as every character feels the exact same aside from their special abilities. And with so many other racing titles such as Riders or the Racing series, it's no wonder these games fall into the background and fail to stand out, not only with how similar they are to each other, but when basically every other racing game is better than it in every way. It ultimately leads to the sad fate of these two games being unbearably forgettable, as they're unable to truly distinguish themselves from the rest of Sonic's racing endeavors. Hey, thanks for watching. Glad I was able to talk about these two rather forgotten Sonic racing games. However, getting through both games was a bit stressful as they can both be extremely tedious and annoying to sit through after a while, as after a while they both become a massive fucking slog. Getting the chance to get my thoughts out there though was nice if nothing else, and I know I said I was going to play a horror game, and that is coming, don't worry. Originally I was going to do it for Halloween, but wasn't able to due to life stuff, but we're doing it eventually. It's coming bro, I'm doing it before the year ends, and if not, I'm doing it next year, I don't care. Anyways, I'm going to stop wasting time now. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. And if you didn't, you can tell me how much I suck as both a YouTuber and a VTuber. Comment section down below. Peace out and enjoy yourself.